Hello, this is the RPG Pundit, the final boss at Internet Shitlords. <laughs> Today I've got Meatball completely blocking my books. <laughs> hey Meatball, look at that, look at that shot. What a great shot of Meatball we're getting anyway. There you go, for those of you who said there wasn't enough Meatball lately. Alright, I also wanted to, before we get started, show you a little something of my adopted homeland, let's say. Which is that, uh, today I'm, I'm not currently smoking anything because I'm about to to have some of these and this is what's uh... these are what are called espejitos so here's a... meatballs very interested <laughs> it's not something you're gonna like to eat meatball no but you know you won't you don't want to eat that it's it's a pastry <laughs> anyway, right around the corner from my house and in a lot of places in the city there are these bakeries right and they they're amazing because they make you know hot bread every every morning uh, and you can get all kinds of different types and, and it's like, you know, a homemade, well not homemade, but a, a store made baguette, let's say, costs maybe 75 cents, something like that, completely fresh. It's pretty awesome. And hey, <laughs> meatballs following around the pastries. Uh, but I'm not a big bread guy, right? I am a big, uh kind of sweets guy, you could say, I have a sweet tooth. And so I picked up these, and uh, you get a half dozen of them for like four bucks. And they are freaking delicious. If you didn't notice what is it, what it is, is uh, it's, a, it's a cookie dulce de leche on the inside, chocolate on top, and in the center there is like a strawberry jelly. It's not for you, meatball! Jesus, meatball! All right. All right, now I'm putting this away before you try to eat the rest of it. I'm gonna eat the one that's in my hand here while I talk. Mm. Yeah, I'm sorry, people, you don't get any. So, today, I was gonna tell you guys about uh, a couple of things I just recently discovered, which uh, amusingly are things that are no doubt gonna be enormous disappointments and sources to frust of frustration for different people in the hobby, okay? So, there's a lot of people who have their vision of the D&D or RPG hobby, and uh, those visions often have certain sacred cows, certain things that they do not want to, to pretend they want to pretend that those are absolute truths, right? And that there's no question about them. But there's a couple of things that, I, that, that have been, that, that are like authoritatively disproven, like disproven with numbers alone, you know? With stats. And so, let's start with the thing that is going to bug the woke crowd. All right. I was not aware of this, because after this, by the way, I'm going to be doing one that's going to bug the grognards. All right, so keep your keep that in mind. Um, I was not aware of this, but apparently this I, I found about found this paper, unless I found it before and then forgotten it, which is possible. About you know, the paper is is I found it like yesterday, but it was published about three years ago. So this is not even really new. This is an old, old day, but it was a scientific paper, right? This is not some article on, on I don't know, on, um, on Gizmodo or on, uh, or on Clownfish TV, right? It, this was an actual study that was made, okay? And in this study, there was the question about whether about the feelings of people about orcs being racist. 2021, I believe, is the, the printing date of the study. So depending on how early or late in 2021, it was somewhere within the three-year mark. And they did an interview of people who, um, I believe it was of people who were gamers, and they selected I believe it was a random selection, but with an emphasis on having a variety of different groups, different um, ethnicities. And the result that they got was that across the board, 
if you asked these people um, whether they thought that orcs were racist, the, the overall result, with relatively very little variation depending on any of the conditions, is that only about 10.2%, 1 in 10, agreed with that statement, believed that it was, that was true that orcs were a racist stereotype, right? So there is no justification for any of the nonsense. Sorry, finishing my cookie here. For any of the nonsense that the woke crowd pushes, right? They have been, and, and this is something that, you know, I really got hit with this phenomenon. Um, it is the kind of tempest in a teapot scenario where obviously what happens is that you have a tiny group of people that are very loud and very repetitive and in a specific location like say Twitter <laughs> they end up making a big storm that makes it seem as though there's an enormous outcry for something right that orcs have to be changed right you can't have evil drow anymore you know you have to you have to do this and that right um, and people think that it must be a, a wildly popular view. This struck me recently with a friend of mine who was lamenting the point of the fact, he, he was saying, well, we need to have, he's having an argument with me that we need to have more censorship on the internet. And I said, why is that? He said, well, because because here's the problem, is that there's other people that are doing disinformation, right? I go, what kind of disinformation? And he's like, well, you know, that there's, there's, there's all of this um, anti-Jewish, anti pro-Palestine um, propaganda being put out on the internet. And it has turned our entire society into this, this vicious... Um, into this vicious and, and anti-Semitic opinion, right? Because what he saw constantly on Twitter, and it's true, if you go on Twitter, you'll see tons of these fake, fake Palestinian um, Twitter accounts that are dedicated to just 100% of the time posting the most obscene propaganda, the worst lies, ridiculous stuff, right? Um, in any post that they can find that has any any vaguest possible connection to either Israel Jews or or the the conflict in Gaza, right? And he saw it so much that it demoralized him and he came to assume because he also saw on the media, right, the hordes of of people marching in Harvard and in in you know in central London and, and whatever else uh in in Ontario and 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 in Los Angeles, usually close to university campuses, making these demands of, you know, immediate ceasefire and normalizing massacres, right? But, in fact, he took that to mean that he, he just assumed that the vast majority of the American, of American society was in favor of the, the, the Gaza and Hamas forces and uh, opposed to Israel. But an actual study that came out shows that the vast majority of Americans, now about 82% of them, support Israel over, over you know, these, these, the enemies of Israel, let's say. Um, and so it's completely contrary to everything that appears on the internet and on, on media, right? And the same thing happened when you had a bunch of locusts who were promoting... These uh, ideas that oh, or, you know, D and D is racist, sexist. It's it's um, it's offensive to minorities. It's transphobic. It's homophobic, and must be changed. And and everybody is demanding that it be changed. Right. So and they tried to change it, and it did actually became worse. Right. <laughs> because nobody wanted it then. You know, there is this this argument that is made that well, no, you have to make the uh, D and D. Um, suitable for all ethnicities and so you have to have a latino-ness to it or a blackness to it or an asian-ness to it and if you don't do that people aren't going to play well that doesn't that doesn't pan out it doesn't pan out with anyone it doesn't pan out with latinos for example you know being one i can tell you you know every single latino i know plays dnd exactly like every white guy i know who plays dnd there it's the they have a there's a quality that does apply universally and transcends 
all of those other conditions of just being a nerd, right? If you're a nerd, you're gonna like D&D. And you're gonna like it for the exact same reason, regardless of whether you, you know, you're a black nerd, a white nerd, a green nerd, a, <laughs> uh, a, a, a nerd that has boy parts or girl parts or is you know, wearing a dress or not, right? Whatever, um, it's the nerdness of it and, and they, they like it as it is. But this was used to try to change things. Now, the other side of the coin, besides the fact that only 10.2% of people are stupid enough to believe that orcs are racist, um, is that an enormous amount, like more than half, like 60 or 70% of um, people who are active in the kind of woke movement are affected with malignant narcissism and borderline personality disorders, right? These, these are mentally ill people. <laughs> and that's the problem, is that those are the people running the thing, right? Um, so anyways, that is the uncomfortable truth for the left, which we hope some leftists here have watched it and, and, and will now hear this and realize that actually nobody gives a damn about any of what you're doing. And that's why D&D 5th Edition um, is falling apart and why the next one is going to be bad too. And why everything you love is falling apart now because everything you or rather everything you've loved destroying is falling apart now and will eventually you know the the the, the culture shift is going to go the other way for you right and you're not going to like it and you know for all you narcissists out there there's absolutely nothing you can do about it because you're not actually a capable or important person there we go. So, but now there is also uncomfortable truths for the grognards, all right? And this is something where I was, I found myself forced to check out some sources because there was a debate going on on the RPG site. And uh, it, was, it was actually, what was it about? It was, um, it was a, I think it was, it was an article that had been put out about kind of the, Jeez, what was it? It was, um, I think it was, a, it was about kind of this, again, the, the, <clears throat> the wretched state of fifth edition or something like that. And, and anyway, so somebody was claiming that fifth edition was not actually so popular, um, because there had been 17 printings <clears throat> of the AD&D first edition player's handbook, which means it was the most popular of all time. And uh, you see a lot of people saying this, even to this day, there's, you know, like, obviously, old people who love old school are very, you know, they're very attached to the editions that they loved, and sometimes to one specific edition that they loved, uh, and want to imagine that it was the, the biggest one, and maybe it was the biggest one for a long time, although actually, I believe that if you count all of the various basic sets that it came out, basic expert D&D was actually the most popular version of of D, D in the early TSR era. Right? It was it was more popular than AD D first or second edition. However, um, <laughs> that's that's neither here nor there. Because the point is said, oh there were 17 printings. How many printings were there of the fifth edition player's handbook? Right? And you know I tried to find that but I, I couldn't actually find that. I know that there's been certifiably at least 12 printings and somebody mentioned somewhere that they had a 16th printing but gave no evidence for that, right? So there might, there's somewhere between 12 and 16 printings of the 5th edition player's handbook. But that doesn't matter, right? Because it doesn't matter what, how many printings you make, it matters how many books you have, right? And specifically how many you sell, right? Presumably if you do a new printing it's because you've sold out, right? So there's presumably, that, that would be the evidence. But the, the thing is, it's like if I took Star Adventurer here, which is a wonderful game and has done very well. It's a, I believe it's the gold bestseller on Drive Through, right? Um, and it's only nine ninety nine for a complete space opera RPG. It's compact, but it's full of stuff and it's got everything you need to, to have a set of rules that you can then direct into space opera gaming, including there's included stuff on you know how to make aliens. Um, without having like a preset universe telling you these are the aliens, right? It tells you these are different, different, different types of aliens you can make. And there's rules for starship combat and all kinds of stuff. There's psychic powers, right? They're kind of like using a force or something. <laughs> um, so, great game, right? If I were to print 
17, let's say I was to print 18 print runs of Star Adventure of, you know, 10, 10 printings each. So that'd be 180 books. Would that mean that now Star Adventure was more popular than AD&D First Edition <laughs> was ever? You know, no, of course not, because AD&D First Edition sold way more. And so what you have to do is you have to see what were the actual book sales, okay? And fortunately now, the records are out about TSR, so we know exactly how many books the first edition player's handbook sold, and it was 1.57 million books. That's, that's nothing to joke about. That's an enormous amount of books that they sold. Okay, that is a fact. It is also a fact, we do not know the exact amount of books that fifth edition player's handbook sold. However, we do know how many it sold through a particular distributor to the big box stores, through its main process of distribution to the big box stores. In the lifetime of the 5th edition player's handbook, just in distribution to big box stores, it sold 1.56 million products. That's not counting everything it sold on Amazon, not counting every, anything it sold in game stores, not counting anything it sold anywhere else on its own website, etc. Uh, or other shipping methods. Okay. And it is estimated, in fact, that the complete sales of the first edition, or the fifth edition player's handbook, because we know the first edition, the complete sales, 1.57 million, okay? The fifth edition is somewhere between three and five million sales. We can't be sure how many, right? Um, so that is, that is the difference. <laughs> so the... You have to accept, I know that you love first edition, I love first edition, I love the, the, especially the DMG more than the player's handbook, but, um, you know, it was a great product, and I love, uh, I especially love Basic Expert and the Rural Cyclopedia, right, those are amazing products, and I liked old D&D, I'm getting more of a flavor for it now, um, but, you have to accept that 5th edition was actually an extremely successful product until it was run to the ground by the malignant narcissists I, I mentioned previously. It, it, it was actually super popular because it was designed by very intelligent people, one of them being me, <laughs> to make sure that it had a broad appeal, right? And that it was easy to play, easy to play casually. Uh, one thing you could, probably could say is it may have sold 3 to 5 million copies, but probably the amount of hours played is nowhere close to the first edition. Because uh, with the first edition, not only have you got, well, decades more time for people to have played with those books, because you could have kept playing long after first edition was not official. There are people playing first edition right now, right? Um, but also, gamers of the old school play much longer, right? So uh, we know that the average campaign, this is also a statistic, the average D&D campaign in fifth edition is six sessions long, right? And usually their, their games are between, uh, what was it, two and a half and four hours long, right? So that is the average. There are some people that are playing way more fifth edition, but there's also, there also means there's a ton of people who are playing sessions and campaigns that do not get to even that, right? Um, but it, that's what it's made. It's made to be a popular game that's easy to pick up, easy to play, that, that is very low pressure. That was all, in large part, what I was pushing with Mike Merles, that, that it needs to be that kind of accessibility. You, the, you want to do the exact opposite of what 3rd Edition did, where 3rd where Edition rewarded you the more of an obsessive nerd you were, the more you read the book meticulously to find little tricks and traps, right? The more you understood all of the mechanics, it's, it, it, it made you more powerful as a player, right? So two players playing characters with exactly the same stats and class, um, you know, same ability scores in class, the one who had, who had read the book was going to be able to make a character that would destroy the other one every time, right? Because of, of what was called system mastery. And, and one of the things I said is you don't want to do system mastery. Because system mastery means that it's a game loved by the most extremely fanatical players at the expense of everybody else, okay? So you want a system that everybody can play and that it, that it, that is easy for everyone to play. And, and that's, that was 5th edition, and that's why it was so successful. You know, so it doesn't behoove us either 
to create these fantasy worlds, right? These fantasy, these fantasies in our minds. Where, you know, leave the fantasy world making to the game settings, right? Um, because just as the, the wokists want to believe that there's an outcry of dark-skinned people out there who are, uh, or, you know, or people who are not dressing according to their assigned birth or something like that out there who would be playing D&D if only D&D looked more like them. And, and we know that that's not true. Um, then there is also that fantasy that, you know, fifth edition was ne will never be as popular as the original greatness of, of the original D and D, right? And it's a stupid argument because it's also there's no there's no actual shame in it. In that you know, D Dungeons and Dragons in the eighties was a couple of guys, you know, a handful of guys working out of an office in Wisconsin, you know. D&D now is Hasbro, a, a multi-billion dollar multinational corporation that, that may or may not have committed crimes against humanity. We're not sure. I can't, can't confirm or deny in any way, but, but you know, a lot of corporations might. So they, this, is, this is two completely different things, right? Um, so the idea, you, you can, one of the things you should always do in this hobby especially, by the way, if you're going to be like a designer, is a, admit to what is real, okay? If you live in a delusion, you're, you're only going to produce something that's worse, right, than, than what you would if you, if you accepted truth. So the accepted truth you have to do is, is okay, 5th edition was successful because it was actually very good at what it was designed to do. And what it was designed to do was be popular with a wide range of people who would find it easy and enjoyable to play. So it is easy and enjoyable to play by the widest berth of possible people. And that has lessons in it that you can learn, right? But if you want to pretend, no, it's just a garbage game, it's all good, blah, 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 you know, then, then you're going to end up, you know, like one of my old teachers used to say, you know, argue for your limitations and you will have them, okay? Um, the limitations of the of the woke crowd are coming home to roost, I think, more and more every day now. And, uh, you know, just be careful that your own um, world bubble doesn't put you into a place where you end up painting yourself into a corner in similar fashion. All right. So that's everything for today. And uh, if you like this video, please share it. Share it anywhere if you think people are going to find it interesting or get pissed off about it. Hit the like button. There's a lot of people that could get pissed off about this one. Uh, hit the like button. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Hit the notification bell so that you are always getting the community posts with meatball in it and so that you're always getting notifications of when I'm doing a live stream because I'm not like a lot of other people that, that does it, you know, every second Tuesday or something like that. I do a live stream when I'm able to on this channel anyways. There will be, you know, I think March 10th is the next inappropriate characters. That's once every four weeks, but that's not this channel. So, you know, do all that stuff and be sure to check out all of my products, okay? Right now, as of, yeah, as of right now, uh, Siege Rules number six of Pundit Files has complete rules for OSR Siege Warfare in, you know, an adventure. And you can find that at the Red Room store. Check it out. There's... There's half a dozen already pundit files, and they're all good, so be sure to check them all out and see. If you like them, pick them up. They're only about three fifty. You can also still find all of the Pundit Presents issues in Drive Through RPG, the old school companion here, a tome of 26 adventures, every single one of which is better than any adventure in Candlekeep Mysteries or in uh, Radiant Citadel. <laughs> you know why? Because I I don't I'm not supporting delusions in my head. Uh, Wilderlands for Wilderness Encounters for Sword and Caravan. Um, if you've got Sword and Caravan, you'll want to pick that one up with some cute, cool little additional tidbits. It's available on PDF and print um, in drive through and print on, on Amazon. So uh, check out all my products, Lion and Dragon, Sword and Caravan, the whole deal. Your support is hugely welcome in order for me to be able to keep fighting a good fight and doing what I'm doing and not having to to try to do something else. Uh, and uh, yeah, keep on uh, keep on checking it out, <laughs> the whole OSR. That's everything for today. I don't have a pipe with me because I was eating a cookie. <laughs>